Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the 1986 Miyazaki film Castle in the Sky. Uh, for some background, Castle in the Sky is the second film of Miyazaki's and the first official film of Studio Ghibli, which was formed after the success of Miyazaki's first film, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Um, Plot-wise, it follows two children, Shida and Pazu, and their adventures to discover the mythical floating island of Laputa. Uh, now some concepts that I picked out and just wanted to focus on were uh, concepts of society's relation with environment and power, uh, the meaningfulness of improvement through industry, and uh, the ethics of technological power. Um, I also kind of discuss all of this in the context of the allegorical nature of Laputa itself and kind of Miyazaki's intentions with the film, considering uh, how it relates to our lives in a global sense uh, and making Castle in the Sky the way he did and any messages uh, you know he might want to get across. So for some social and economic context... Um, Castle in the Sky, 1986, which is shown by the green circle. Um, uh, the image you're looking at is the Nikkei Index. It is the stock average or of the stock market for Japan, which is um, measured by the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And in 1989, shown by the blue circle, um, they hit a 10-year recession. Uh, it was a stock market crash um, that they really have not recovered fully from. So uh, the economy plummets, unemployment rises, and from a social standpoint, the meaningfulness of work and the industrial superstructure of Japanese society that we've seen in like Tokyo Sonata and many other films we've seen with unemployment uh, began to lose meaning. And I think Castle in the Sky works as an almost you know precursor, a warning sign to this period. It kind of foreshadows that this over-industrialized economy and society really is not sustainable. So, um, within the film itself, there are large disparities of wealth and power that exist. It's kind of the military versus the industrial workers in towns reminiscent of, uh, kind of traditional western mill towns, which Miyazaki said was an influence of his with the animation uh, from England and Wales. Uh, to uh, you know, the mid-Atlantic U.S., and uh, pretty much all during the turn of the 20th century, uh, end of the 19th century, which is kind of when the film is set. Um, but above this industrial society lies the true landscape of the, uh, that the narrative exists upon, which is the sky. Uh, the sky not only holds the giant airships of the military and the sky pirates, uh, but the mythical Laputa, a floating island of untold riches and power. So the sky represents, in many ways, power. You know, the elevation of one over others. As each group of characters, which, you know, are kind of separated as Pazu and Shida, uh, the sky pirates, and the military, kind of Agent Muska, they strive for power and control through the sky whether that is a control over technology, control over their own fates, or the control of the society below. So uh, I made the connection that these varying perspectives of power resemble classical arguments of realism versus idealism, wherein some wish for a cooperation of peace for all, and others strive for domination rather than coexistence. And uh, this is a, a really good quote I found of kind of representing that, especially within Castle in the Sky. The story divides characters into two classifications, those who wish to stop the villains and help people in trouble, which kind of Shida, Pazu, Pazu's boss, Uncle Palm, and those who pursue the power of Laputa, Dola, Muska, and the government. Uh, and the former is consistent with cooperation for peace based on classical liberalism or human nature idealism, whereas the latter is influenced by desire for power, based on human nature, realism. So I think this is really where the intersection of nature enters the film. Um, it, it is within this power struggle, idealism versus realism, that the overarching omnip omnipotent power is shown, the power of nature. Uh, while all social groups interact and clash in many ways, every character is also facing a battle with the power of nature. 
Now, uh, Laputa, seen here, is kind of the visualization of this power. It's, it's a powerful central floating tree and a crystal supporting a past futuristic society that, that built it. Uh, a construction that kind of makes you consider whether this central tree was grown by the society or actually was, uh, the society was created around the tree and its power. I'm kind of leaning towards the latter in that sense. Now, the idealism, or classical liberalism argument, is shown through the past citizens of Laputa, and continued by Shida and Pazu, which are kind of these ideals of coexistence with nature, or working as stewards and stewardship, much like the robots that remain on Laputa to tend the abandoned gardens, which you see throughout the entire film. And then the other side is realism, which more seeks to control nature and Laputa for human benefit. Now, uh, Castle and Sky employs these familiar perspectives, and they have kind of reverberated through various international politics of our own when it comes to issues of fracking, climate change, and other human industrialization of nature's power. And uh, kind of moving on from this point, I also kind of discussed the idea of Laputa as an escape. Uh, now, the sky above containing a magical floating island, a veritable Golden of Eden of power and beauty, which is kind of an, an escape from the industrial and fading world below. Uh, and the nuclear aspect uh, of this also comes forth in a sense, wanting to escape over the nuclear horrors that came from above, uh, which is a, a specific type of violence that went on to really shape Japan the 40 years that came after World War II up to the making of Castle in the Sky. So uh, I think it is uh, the most upfront examples of this is the weapon system of Laputa. It's shown to have a remarkable resemblance uh, to a mushroom cloud, uh, seen here in this still. Now this instills a natural fear of technological power in the film, and shows a strong yet peaceful force of nature uh, being a better alternative. Uh, now, for me, I, I consider this to be a really strong symbol, showing the majesty of Laputa as a paradise lost, really, only disturbed by humanity's influence, L kind of leaving the nuclear power of Laputa not something that should be in our hands. And uh, I think another important aspect of the natural tapestry of Laputa is its caretakers, which are the robots built by the formal citizens of Laputa who have now been left to tend the overgrown world in the sky. Uh, now these uh, robots serve as representations of, well, I think, the transitory and circular nature of existence. You have these, p these very advanced people who built robots seemingly fall from nature, but after the destruction of the Laputian's empire, the robots themselves coexist and assimilate into nature better than humanity ever does. And uh, the Laputian robot's role in this kind of ecotopia, as it's stated, is kind of summed up well in this quote. The caretaker robot uh, is a figure that reconciles culture to nature and spirit after the collapse of an empire. Seen in this light, the robot represents a restored relationship of technology to nature, when the human impulse towards warfare and destruction is overcome. In a stunning reversal of creator and image, the robot represents what humanity can become when war is set aside at the end of civilization. Which I think is just a, a really amazing quote that really captures kind of uh, the meaning of the robots you know, and their symbolism in the film. Now, going back um, and discussing the actual film and its, and its impact society, uh, I want to talk about Miyazaki himself, uh, born in 1941, growing up in post-World War II Japan. Uh, he lived through decades of restructuring and became witness to one of the most rapid economic recoveries from a war-losing nation in history. And I think this instilled many pacifist ideologies within Miyazaki, something that becomes apparent in many of his films, uh, much like many nations after World War II, specifically the United States, Japan had spent five to ten years assembling a workforce of laborers to create machines and technology to fight in the war, the 1930s and the 1940s. Now, in order to maintain their citizens' relevance with their acquired skills, uh, these countries turn to international commerce, becoming some of the largest exporters of technology in the entire world. 
and really an unprecedented industrial age, a capitalist age. But, you know, as seen 40 years later in 1989, uh, the economic boom, especially in Japan, eventually falls. However, as Miyazaki was creating Castle in the Sky, the cracks had already kind of begun to form in the productivity and supply demand chains of Japan's international trade. You know, with a crash nearly imminent, Castle in the Sky in many ways is not only a reflection towards the dangers of separating from technology to rekindle our connection to nature, but really it's a message to the citizens of the world that despite the economic gain, this industrialism as a source of labor and lifestyle even, which is born from past uh, war and violence, was not sustainable. Uh, I think this is seen in narrative form through just the time period that Castle in the Sky takes place, which uh, uh, we are kind of meant to believe is set around the end of the 19th century, I, bl I think, uh, which was kind of the last great industrial boom for many Western countries that's preceding World War I and preceding World War II, uh, which you can actually see here in this still of an image that Pazu's father took of Laputa 10 to 20 years prior, uh, and if you look quite closely, it says 1868, um, so, so that's kind of the era we're looking at, you know, this uh, beginning of industrialization. Now, the final large point I think I made my essay really is uh, of the narrative promoting a rekindling of connection to nature, which is shown best in the final scenes of the film. Uh, Shida, the protagonist, who is a royal descendant of Laputa, says to Agent Muska, the military antagonist, in their final confrontation that a person cannot survive away from the earth. Despite the hope that Laputa provides for power and escape, the earth is, only, is really the only home they may ever know, and it is those uh, who coexist with it who can benefit through survival. Um, and Sheeta sings a song from her childhood home's valley that further expresses this point. Uh, the lyrics read, Put your roots in the soil, live together with the wind. Um, as the robots of Laputa have done, as the children of the film are able to do, and many of the workers and farmers in the mill towns also do. Uh, the final visual representation of this motif is kind of the shedding of Laputa's weapon weaponry at the end. Uh, which is kind of brought about by uh, Shida's destruction spell that she was taught by her grandmother. That's kind of, that ends up revealing this giant, expansive root system beneath the metal and the technology. So it is shown that the island was not overgrown with nature, but in fact was built upon the central tree, and its roots kind of supporting all things. So Laputa itself really learns to coexist with nature as Miyazaki's pacifist ideology encourages the audience to really do the same. And uh, kind of uh, in conclusion, looking forward into the future from this film, I, I find it really important to understand and analyze Castle in the Sky as a reminder of the integral part all balance with nature plays in our existence. And I think Miyazaki makes some really salient points in his film when he's discussing society's relation with environment and power, meaningfulness within industrial improvement, and the ethics of technological power. 